angels, his people, all of them, the people that we love, the people who love us, are all going to be there. Wow. And it gets even better, as if that's not good enough. This feast is provided free of charge. No cost involved whatsoever. Oh, don't get me wrong. It was very costly. Uh, I, I looked it up the other day. The, the typical cost of a, of a wedding today in our country, get ready, $29,000. Can you believe that? That's almost obscene in my mind. But that's nothing compared to what this particular wedding banquet cost. It cost... God, his own son. It cost Jesus, the eternal son of God, his own life. It costs us nothing, free of charge. Now, most times, if you're invited to a wedding, you don't expect to have to pay, right? That would be, I, I suppose somebody has done it, <laughs> but... That would really be poor taste, wouldn't it? Come to our wedding and it'll only cost you $50 per head, right? But even, even a wedding banquet, even a wedding reception um, will have some costs involved. Uh, if it's a wedding that's far away on the lower 48, you're gonna have to pay for an airline ticket or use up your miles, probably get a motel room. There's always the wedding presents that you have to buy. And depending on the current state of your wardrobe, you might have to fork out a boatload of bucks just to get some nice clothes to wear. But not this one. Not the wedding banquet of heaven. There is no expense involved whatsoever. Jesus was about to pay the full price in just a couple of days after he spoke these words with his blood. He paid the full cost of all people of all time for admission into the banquet of heaven. There is no sin that hasn't been paid for. No sinner whose admission into heaven hasn't been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Even the clothes that we would wear to this banquet have been provided for us. That's that robe of Christ's righteousness that he clothes us with at our baptism. The feast is ready. The king said, come, come to the feast. Hey, you'd be crazy, right? Crazy not to accept an invitation like that. But that's exactly what so many of the people in that story Jesus told did. And that's exactly what the people he was telling the story to were doing. They were rejecting this invitation, those, those religious leaders of Israel. Just like we heard in the last parable last week, we hear about the servants sent out by the king being mistreated and even killed. Can you imagine that? Even the people who came with the invitation were just, it wasn't just a polite thanks, but no thanks. It was, we're going to murder you. And that's exactly what the Jewish religious leaders had been doing for generations, as God would send his prophets to them with his words of comfort as well as warning. They were abused, they were persecuted, and so often they were martyred. In the story Jesus told, the ones who, who rejected the invitation, they weren't just going to miss out on a great meal. Jesus said in this story, those who had mistreated and murdered the servants themselves would be destroyed. Their city burned to the ground, he said. Well, that's exactly what happened. 35 or so years after Jesus spoke that parable, when the Romans finally came in and leveled the city of Jerusalem to the ground. Maybe this is a good time to, to, to pause for just a moment and ask ourselves, well, why was Jesus telling this? This parable as well as the other ones that we've been hearing about to those religious leaders who were plotting his death. What was the point? Well, the point was this. He was warning them before it was too late. Now imagine the love of Jesus that would 
go so far as to those enemies who were plotting his death to continue to reach out to them. And sadly, they did not heed the warning. They, they carried out the murder of not just the servants of the king, but the son of the king just a few short days later. So what about us? The invitation is extended to all. Well, the fact that you're here this morning is a pretty good indication that you have accepted that invitation. But let's not strain ourselves, patting ourselves on the back for accepting that invitation. Because it wasn't us. At the end of the parable, Jesus said, many are invited, but few are chosen. The choice God's by grace alone through the gospel that he led you and me to believe the invitation to trust the son whose blood paid for our admission into heaven that's us because if it were us up to us we would be foolish enough to turn it down we don't have it in us we don't have it in us by 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 birth we don't have it in us by nature we don't have it in us by ourselves, but God in his grace, in his grace alone, not only extends that invitation to us, but has led us to believe it, and trust it, and accept it. But also, let's not get complacent about it. In that parable, some of the people who were invited to the wedding banquet turned it down because they had other things. They had other things on their calendar. Things that in and of themselves weren't wrong at all. Um, some had to go out to their fields. There were fields to plow and, har and crops to harvest. Others went about their business. They had shops to open and other business to do. Those were not wrong. Not at all. To carry out vocations to provide for yourself and your family. How could that be wrong? What was wrong was they made their business more important than the king's business, and in doing so, they ended up rejecting his invitation. It's easy for us to do the same thing. To, to start letting other things crowd our king of kings out of number one place in our lives, because there's so many other things on our agenda, right? Business, pleasure, Things for the kids, things for ourselves, things that aren't wrong in and of themselves by any means, and yet become dangerous when we let them crowd Jesus out of number one place in our lives. And giving the impression that we don't think his invitation is all that important, that can easily lead to rejecting that invitation. Think about it. What could be more important what could possibly be more important than our relationship with Jesus Christ? What could be longer lasting than the heaven that he offers to us? And the answer is obviously nothing.